Okay, great. So um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all this evening. We were going to do this at uh, Green Party Conference in Brighton as a fringe, uh, but, um, but now we're here all over the country and I don't know, possibly all over the world. Uh, and I think we're gonna have a fascinating uh, debate. Um, I should stress that I'm speaking here very much in a personal capacity uh, this evening. Um, Obviously, uh, I'll have things to say from a, a sort of Green Party perspective, and I'll have things to say from a sort of XR perspective, but I'm very much speaking for myself. And, and here's what I want to say. So I want to say that we don't know, first thing I want to say is that we don't know uh, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and coronavirus has shown that us very clearly. Um, uh, don't get me wrong, uh, it was very predictable that um, a pandemic somewhat like this would come along sooner or later. Uh, in that sense, it's not a true black swan event at all. Uh, it, it's technically, you could call it a grey swan. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, the fact that it, ha it has this particular form, and we still don't know what that form is um, in any very precise way, uh, and all sorts of the consequences that it's having and the way our lives have been completely turned upside down, none of that was uh, anticipatable. So uh, we don't know what the, uh, what the future holds. But my second point is that we have very strong suspicions, or at least we should have very strong suspicions. We should have very strong suspicions that basically uh, it's over for uh, this civilization and possibly for civilization in general but certainly for, um, for this civilization, and certainly, especially in uh, this country. Um, that should have been clear to us if it wasn't clear before, uh, since the general election um, in December. Uh, do you remember, it was uh, seems such a long time ago now, it was supposed to be the climate election. Um, okay, so it was won with an overwhelming majority by a, a melting block of ice in that case. Um, the general election should have taught us that essentially um, the chances of the Green Party achieving its demands or of Extinction Rebellion achieving its demands are uh, now um, minuscule. In fact, I think the situation is especially bad for Greens because although the Green Party demands are slightly less um, um, dramatic in terms of time scale than Extinction Rebellion's demands, the route that the Green Party has towards achieving those demands is more gradual, if you think of that route as essentially a route um, through uh, electoral uh, gains. Um, it's not credible to think of going from um, one seat to um, 330 seats um, in one election, uh, especially uh, in a country with our absurd electoral system. So uh, we're out of time, uh, essentially. Uh, that leads to my third point, which is that adaptation needs to move up the agenda. We need to adapt to the very strong likelihood of climate and ecological uh, decline. Uh, that adaptation needs to include deep adaptation. Uh, deep adaptation means uh, adaptation to the uh, possibility or likelihood of uh, civilization as we know it um, collapsing. Fourthly, however, I want to go back to where I started. Remember that we don't know. Um, so while we may have these very strong suspicions, we may also, and we should, in my belief, in my belief be open to the possibility that we're wrong. Uh, and in particular, we should open to, be open to the possibility that the coronavirus may inadvertently be giving us one last chance. Uh, and I think it is. Um, I think that this coronavirus crisis is basically our last chance. Um, now, there's been a lot of talk about last chances over the years. You remember, for example, when we were told we had 100 months to save uh, the world, um, it wasn't so widely announced when those 100 months uh, came to an end. Um, uh, we've had a lot of uh, moments that were called the last chance saloon, and, there, and in that regard, I think there's been some dangerous crying of wolf. Um, but I think that uh, this actually is um, our last chance. If we go back to the time scale of Extinction Rebellion, or even the slightly less a uh, hardcore timescale of the Green Party, which is still extremely demanding. Um, I think we can um, see coherently that there is a moment of inflection now. I think that is clear. 
I think there is a possibility of rebuilding from lockdown and rebuilding shattered economies in radically different ways. And in fact, there are some reasons for thinking that that is, uh, that is likely to happen. People will not want to go back to their traditional um, commutes in many cases, for example. Uh, a lot of people and a lot of governments will be um, less comfortable with um, massive expansions of air travel than they were until uh, very recently. So there is, I think, some real hope that this coronavirus may be um, our chance. But I put it to you that it should realistically be regarded as um, our last chance. Um, it's uh, implausible to think that another chance as good as this will come in the next few years. Uh, and if it doesn't, then it's extremely implausible to think that we're going to um, have a route um, out of um, climate and ecological uh, breakdown. One reason why I think the coronavirus crisis may be uh, uh, our chance is that there is a possibility of the delegitimization of the entire failed uh, United Kingdom political class who with a tiny handful of exceptions have um, um, behaved completely uselessly uh, during this um, uh, pandemic so far. The handful of exceptions includes uh, Rory Stewart, Rory Stewart uh, Caroline Lucas, Molly Scott Cato, uh, not many others. Uh, even the Green Party I think has played a poor hand so far in the coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, so I think that the political class in this country and also in the United States and, and Brazil and various other countries, um, which are not coincidentally, and we could talk about this, uh, about the worst countries in the world, um, uh, climatically and biodiversity wise, um, that political class may be delegitimated and that may provide an opportunity for a, a radical uh, change uh, in the coming years, months, or even weeks. Um, coronavirus crisis has of course been extremely difficult for um, Extinction Rebellion um, because our number one uh, method of being able to go into the streets, as we say, um, has become, um, as you might put it, doubly illegal. Uh, it's become immoral uh, as well as uh, illegal unless it's done in extremely careful ways, et cetera, et cetera. We could talk about that. Nevertheless, I would like to suggest again that I think that Extinction Rebellion may have a better chance of progressing fast post-coronavirus than, uh, than the Green Party. Uh, why do I think that? Well, one reason I think that is because, as I say, the Green Party as a whole, while performing uh, better than other parties in this crisis, and obviously way better than our atrocious government, um, has not exactly uh, trailblazed in the way that it could have done to take full advantage um, of this uh, of this crisis in the sense of um, using it as a moment for arguing radically for um, precaution and for a totally different way of living and thinking about risk. So this is a moment for um, for radical vision and potential change. We should be talking about um, transforming our society. We should be talking about transformative adaptation. Um, we should be talking about mitigation, of course. We should be talking even about prevention and, as I've just mentioned, precaution. The agenda of transformative adaptation, which has been a key part of Greenhouse's agenda uh, in the last few years, is absolutely key. Transformative adaptation means adapting in ways that are simultaneously are um, good from a carbon perspective, good from a nature perspective, good from the perspective of transforming into the kind of society you want to transform uh, into anyway. Um, transformative adaptation prefigures what we need, it overlaps with deep adaptation, and it naturally fits, by the way, with key uh, agendas, both of Extinction Rebellion, uh, the Citizens' Assembly agenda, and of localization. And I think that the localization agenda um, has uh, taken a huge potential step forward uh, with this pandemic as we've seen the importance of local resilience and so forth um, as never before. We might come back to that. And by the way, I'm doing a, um, another talk on that with Helena Norberg Hodge, the, the brilliant author of um, Ancient Futures and the founder of, of uh, Local uh, Futures uh, on Monday. I'll share the information about that in the chat later in this call. So that's, it seems to me, where we are at or ought to be at um, at, this, at this moment. Coronavirus is, I believe, giving us our last chance to put in place the kind of agendas that I just described without the extremely strong likelihood of civilizational collapse. So finally, and I know that this is a lot of what John wants to talk about, how do we realize that uh, opportunity? Uh, if we are going to realize it. And the main point I want to make here is that I don't think we realize it through violence. 
Um, one of the key reasons why Extinction Rebellion is dedicated to nonviolence is the evidence, which is quite strong, that in most circumstances, nonviolence is more effective. So, you know, there's obvious drawbacks to violence, like it's not nice and not good to hurt people. Um, but if you also add to that that it's uh, not so effective as not hurting people, that's a pretty powerful um, cocktail. Um, Ecotage, for example, will not, I believe, get enough people uh, on our side. And I don't believe that we can win without a plurality on our side. In that sense, I think that democracy is a sine qua non, both because, again, it's a good thing, but also because um, it's something which you just can't do without. Uh, and in order to see how you just can't do without it, look even at a country like uh, China, you might think that China is the ultimate in, uh, in a country which is um, uh, dictatorial in our world today. Um, but actually China understands very well uh, that without having most of the people on its side most of the time, uh, it cannot uh, survive. That's why, for example, China, very much unlike ourselves, uh, put in place uh, incredibly uh, in the region of the pandemic, a 24 hour constant um, news and information uh, uh, channel. Um, you know, and of course some of it was propaganda, but an awful lot of it was, was true and an awful lot of it was very practical advice, et cetera, et cetera. China is very scared. The, the government of China are very scared of their own people. The anecdote I love to quote about that is the fact that um, China essentially banned the film um, Avatar a decade ago um, because they were terrified that it would ignite, ignite rural land revolts. Um, there is no way in our modern world of running a society where you don't have um, most of the people in more or less willing to acquiesce more or less most of the time with uh, the way that your society works. I think the idea of a sort of violent uh, vanguard who are going to potentially save us from an eco perspective uh, is almost certainly um, a fantasy. And those are my remarks. I'm really glad to be here discussing this this evening with you and debating it with, uh, with my excellent uh, Greenhouse colleague, John Foster. Uh, thank you, Rupert. Uh, I wonder whether anybody's got any questions for clarification that uh, we could have. Uh, so uh, Chris says the global debt burden uh, will be so huge for most people and countries to bear, how might the post-corona war economic settlement look? Mm. Well, obviously that could be a huge question. I'll just make an initial remark on it, which is that um, I think that what is clear is that governments have found um, what many of us have been saying for years they could have if they wanted to, which is uh, the, the so-called magic money tree. Uh, it has been found during this uh, pandemic. Governments are just just decided to mobilize uh, trillions uh, instantly. Um, for me, the background to this, I don't agree with every word of it, but the background to this, which is basically right, is in modern monetary theory. My friend and colleague, um, um, Richard Murphy, is one of the key people uh, uh, on this. Um, and uh, basically, uh, if, you, if you really cut it down extremely crudely, uh, it means governments can simply create the money that they need. Um, so uh, I think if we think about this in the right way, uh, we shouldn't actually worry too much about the global debt burden. Um, I, would, uh, I would recommend also David Graeber's book, uh, Debt, The First 5,000 Years, as a way of uh, thinking completely out of this idea that uh, we need to be tyrannized by the idea of debt. And, sorry, there was a question before that that I missed. Um, about uh, what is, and I think this is critical for when you talk about this, that you talk about civilizational collapse, and you've talked about this, yeah. this civilization's finished quite a bit. Yeah. And what do you mean? Uh, so Caroline says you, you've, uh, she's not found it clear. Do you mean the economic financial system, rule of current law, liberal democracy, practices, customs? the level of technology in the rich countries. Perhaps you'd like to say a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So again, obviously it could be a huge question. Uh, I, have, uh, I have written about it, for example, in This Civilization is Finished. Um, by definition, um, there's a certain amount of uh, a non-specificity um, uh, in this, um, because um, civilizational collapse is a, is a vast, um, complicated, variegated uh, phenomenon. Um, I think perhaps the best place to start, rather than a, a definition or something, is to just talk about instances. So, you know, the classic example um, is uh, 
uh, is the Roman Empire. Um, and I think we, we know what it meant for the Roman Empire to collapse, which was, of course, a, a, a long, gradual process. Um, and um, uh, what's particularly fascinating to me in relation to the Roman Empire is that we, we focus in the Roman Empire on Rome and the Western Roman Empire. But what happened in the Eastern Roman Empire after they divided them was in many ways much more interesting. The Eastern Roman Empire managed to avert uh, collapse. Uh, and how did they do that? And they survived for another thousand years, um, you know, based in Byzantium and so on. And how did they do that? Well, basically they did it by simplifying their society, by decomplexifying their society. Um, Tainter has written on this uh, very interestingly. Um, uh, and um, um, so what they did, if you, might, you might say that what they did is they sort of, they move voluntarily in the direction of where collapse would have led them to anyway, but that stopped them from going all the way to, um, to collapse. Um, if you insist on something a bit more like uh, a definition, I would say that, uh, that a society uh, that has collapsed is a society which has experienced uh, an uneven, a ragged, a non-voluntary uh, end to, our, to its normal um, systems uh, and methods of um, supporting its people uh, of, uh, of making sense of holding itself together and so on and so forth. Um, so collapse nearly always uh, involves um, significant mortality. Another called classic locus for collapse uh, in terms of examples, of course, is Jared Diamond's book called simply um, Collapse, which uh, gives you a load of, uh, of, uh, of powerful um, examples. I'm putting the, some of these things in the chat. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we've got a few more questions. So one about uh, what you said about the Green Party of England and Wales, and uh, asking for a bit more detail on on how you think it hasn't played a good hand in this crisis. What's your critique of the uh, Green Party? Yeah, yeah. So so for quite a while, the the Green Party. Um, didn't really say anything um, about uh, the actual meat of the, the crisis. The Green Party said some good things about, oh, this is bad for, uh, for renters, um, uh, and, um, uh, oh, we should have a sort of uh, good um, social way of, uh, of, uh, of dealing with this emerging crisis and so on. But it didn't really say anything um, in terms of policy in terms of the actual uh, meat and drink of things like, uh, do we keep the airports open? Do we have a uh, quarantine? Uh, should we have a, a lockdown? Um, uh, also aspects such as, uh, should we uh, be concerned about uh, food supplies? Should we um, set up some kind of um, system of, uh, of food rationing to prevent everything from being um, sucked out of the supermarkets in the way that was happening for, uh, for a while? Uh, the Green Party was essentially silent uh, on these things as uh, all uh, pretty much all elected politicians were. Uh, recently, uh, Caroline Lucas has come out with a, with a plan um, which uh, um, talks about having a community shield and getting serious about contact tracing and testing and so on. That's been really good. Uh, uh, and Molly's been, uh, been good pretty much throughout. Um, uh, and yeah, as Steve has said, some green, local Green parties have been doing a, a good job, uh, very definitely. But I'm talking about national leadership. I don't see that the Green Party nationally gave any uh, real leadership until recently. Um, and that's especially disappointing given that the Green Party is the party that should have uh, um, uh, understood best uh, the relevance of the precautionary principle to what was happening or rather what was not happening uh, here. And so that's been disappointing for me. Okay, so I'm just gonna, there's just two more that I'm gonna ask and then I think we'll go on to John Foster. So one is, um, uh, yeah, so on that, just on that set, uh, Chris has said the Greens did suggest bringing in a basic income, but we won't go into that debate right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. But, but in terms of actually confronting the, 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 yes. the, the nature of the emergency, that's what I'm talking about, where the Greens were weak. So um, David Bent has said that the latest polling evidence Suggest that people trust the government on COVID, and so far more than media, far more than the media actually. So, what evidence do you have that, uh, that there is a delegitimization of our political class, or is it something that you just think is going to happen uh, when we when we do the post mortem? Yeah, I, I think I think it's almost bound to happen when we do the post mortem. 
Um, it should have happened already, and ironically, it would have happened already if we had, if we had, had a proper media. Uh, the media have been mostly pathetic uh, on the crisis. Uh, the exceptions are um, uh, Channel 4 has been good. Uh, one or two specific elements of the BBC, such as Newsnight, have been good. Mostly the BBC has been absolutely terrible, uh, just like Tony Benn. Uh, um, said um, back in the day, uh, whenever there's a national crisis, you can trust the BBC to, to fall in line behind uh, the government. Piers Morgan, astoundingly, has redeemed himself and has actually been really, really good and really strong, whereas he's normally just, you know, absolutely appalling. Uh, he's even spoken out very strongly and powerfully against, uh, against Trump. Um, so the media have really let us down. If they had given proper scrutiny to the government, people, more people would have understood that this country has almost the worst record in the entire world on this, uh, on this coronavirus uh, crisis. And there's a reason for that, it's to do with government policy. Um, uh, I'm still optimistic that, uh, that trust in the government may collapse before the post-mortems, um, once more people start to realize the, the, the real numbers of people who are dying. And also once, the, uh, once it's sort of, um, well, let's put it this way. Um, so probably within about a, a, a month, uh, most people in this country will know someone who's died from, from COVID-19. Um, uh, that could be game changing. But yeah, uh, I, I'm not predicting that that delegitimization will definitely uh, happen. Def uh, certainly not predicting it will definitely happen soon. I'm saying that it should happen, that I think it may happen and we should be ready for it to happen. And we should be trying to create it ha to happen. And finally, I think the, uh, this relates to what you were saying about societal collapse. How does the complexity of our social and economic systems play into, play into the collapse? How do we act tactically to the benefit of the long-term future? You might just say a little bit about that and then perhaps we could... I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure I followed that, Anne. Sorry, it's how does the complexity... So it relates to what you were saying... Yes. ...about... Um, the uh, the collapse the collapse of uh, civilizations yeah and uh, you talked about Rome and the complexity of the Roman Empire and how does the complexity of our social and, and economic systems play into the collapse? All right, yeah. How so this is this is a vital system. question. I mean, the fundamental point here is that uh, we live in a ridiculously um, interconnected, globalized uh, world. And we've been lucky to get away with most of that so far during the, the pandemic. That may not uh, continue uh, that luck. Um, but we see, for example, the, the way that, uh, we've seen that our just-in-time delivery system uh, ruthlessly exposed uh, by this pandemic. We've seen uh, how, for example, uh, we've got um, very little control over uh, medicines, medical supplies, other kinds of um, essentials in this country, because they're part of a kind of worldwide uh, commoditized um, system where there's no buffering. We've, one way of describing it, which I think is helpful, um, is that we've seen how the ruthless drive to be more efficient, which has been um, a dominant aspect of the uh, international system um, for the last couple of generations, is in the context of crises like this, horrendously inefficient, because you suddenly get these kinds of bottlenecks and lacks of, uh, of, uh, of things which are essential, things which are strate strategic. Um, so uh, in that way, um, we're seeing we're, and we're experiencing the vulnerability of an overly complex uh, society. Uh, and actually part of my hope is that people, part of my hope for how this might be an inflection point uh, and how we might start to uh, move in the kind of direction that we need to move in anyway in relation to the longer, deeper climate and ecological emergency is that people might start to get that and decide that actually we don't want to be so vulnerable in the future. So we need to simplify, we need to decomplexify, we need to localize, uh, et cetera. Okay, thank you. So there's one other comment. Uh, oh, there's a comment about the uh, collapse book that people can perhaps look that's at. That's a bit technical, I think. I'll, I'll come back to David outside think, well, the call, I think. And uh, perhaps we can get onto this in the discussion afterwards. There's also a comment about the waste, the problem of waste that's happened. Yeah. This is specifically to do with the reaction to the, the uh, COVID-19 crisis, I think. Yeah, uh, I think that's a, 
I, I think that's a really, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, Molly Scott Cato and I have been wanting to try to get onto this point. It's quite a challenging point to get into the, the discourse um, while you're in the middle of, you know, um, 2,000 people a day uh, dying, which is closer to the, re the real number than the numbers that the governments are, are giving. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think from a green perspective, this is essential. And it actually relates to the point about complexity. Um, if we imagine the possibility, which is very real, of this pandemic going on and on, um, for the next uh, couple of years or so. Um, uh, we can't seriously think about doing everything on sort of a single use basis in terms of PPE and so on and so forth. There has to be proper green ways of doing it. Uh, otherwise, we're obviously um, uh, worsening um, the, uh, the ecological crisis, etc. cetera. Um, you have to have ways of dealing with something like this, which don't make everything more and more complicated and more and more burdensome. Or, this, or you are adding to the likelihood of societal collapse. That's the kind of way that the, the Roman Empire um, did collapse through having various kinds of burdens that it couldn't hold up anymore. Okay, um, we've had a... So I'm now going to hand over to John Foster and he's going to have his response to, to what Rupert's been saying and then there'll be time for more questions and hopefully some discussion. So I've unmuted John. Thank you. Uh, uh, right. Uh, so, okay, uh, shall I go? Yes, go on. Right, okay. Um, thank you, Anne, and um, good evening, everybody. And, and thank you, Rupert, for um, a stimulating start to the evening. Um, I want to put COVID or coronavirus, or whatever you're going to call it, to one side if we can. I mean, I know that's uh, quite a challenge at the moment, but um, I'm a bit skeptical about this analogy. Uh, you know, people have learnt uh, right across the board, the whole population has learnt to change our lifestyles dramatically uh, in response to the COVID emergency. And so that somehow is going to carry over to people's response to the climate emergency. I'm skeptical of that. Um, there may be some carryover. I think it's something that we need to come back to perhaps. But um, I want to go back to, to where Rupert's starting premises, um, coronavirus apart, which were, um, and I agree with them, both of them, that the electorates pretty unambiguous endorsement of Brexit and Boris back in December ought to mark a turning point. It ought to mark a point at which, as it were, the good old <clears throat> Churchillian maxim, keep buggering on, uh, ceases to be the Green Party's slogan. Um, and that the idea that in 20 years, we can make a decisive difference now through the primary the electoral route uh, that should be regarded as over. Um, so I agree with that. And I think where Rupert and I differ is in the, um, in the conclusions we, we, we want to draw from those premises. Uh, Rupert, I think, albeit with a bit of hedging, uh, seems to me to be saying that the Green programme um, almost certainly now can't come to power by the electoral route in time to prevent major civilizational collapse and therefore green politics going forward must be about banging the drum for transformative or deep adaptation to the effects of that collapse. Um, what I want to say is um, something different. The program can't come to power, the green program can't come to power by that route so it must come to power by some different route, if such a route could plausibly be imagined in order to prevent civilizational collapse. And then the question is, what might such a plausible or not wholly implausible route or program look like? And I stress not wholly implausible because that's I think the domain where we're in for all of this now. Um, 
it's the nature of our situation that whatever hope we invest has to be invested against very heavy odds um, because that's the only way we have a chance of changing the odds. So what would a, what would a non-electoral um, program for bringing, as it were, green ideas to power uh, in time to prevent civilizational collapse, what might it look like? Um, I think there's one, as it were, political philosophical assumption you have to make at the outset of this, and that is that those who fully understand the present danger, and by that, of course, I mean the uh, present danger posed by the climate emergency, not the actually vastly less dangerous <laughs> Um, COVID-19 emergency, those who fully understand the present danger are thereby fully entitled to take power by whatever means they can, and whatever means might have a chance of success in order to avert it. I think the fact that, judging from the last head count back in December, only 3% of the electorate currently support a programme adequate to the climate emergency, of course, that's tactically significant, but it's irrelevant in terms of justifying what you do because the whole human future is at stake. Now, I just state this boldly here at the beginning because it's the basis of everything I'm going to go on to say. I'll obviously, come back to that, I'm sure. The programme, or a not wholly implausible programme, I guess it's threefold. Firstly, delegitimizing and destabilizing and rendering inoperable the fossil fuel state. I hope that shorthand sufficiently explains itself. Secondly, putting in place a shadow eco state to take over as and when. And thirdly, continuing to publicize as climate driven the disasters, the raft of disasters, wildfires, floods and no doubt, further pandemics, which will increasingly occur over the next couple of decades as a means of educating the public at large into at least acquiescence when those political and economic changes are forced upon them. Now, this is evidently a revolutionary program. I think only revolution, albeit of an unprecedented kind, can deliver a social and economic transformation of the extent and rapidity which the emergency demands. The how is obviously wide open to debate, but that all serious Greens must now be revolutionaries is not, I don't think. I and mean, that's, if you like, my single take home message. But of course, obviously, the how is what matters. Um, and clearly, as we come to try and pursue elements of that three part program, there's going to be a lot of overlap with the sort of thing that, that Rupert was, has been recommending and endorsing. So, for instance, in the business of destabilizing the fossil fuel state, mass civil disobedience of the Extinction Rebellion kind um, will continue to be vitally important. And the more of it that XR can go on stirring up when that, again, becomes possible, the better. But I think more is needed under this head. And in particular, I think the notion of the climate strike has to be taken to a new level. So if we just go back to what I was saying a minute or two ago about those who understand the full extent of the danger having the right to act, let's also consider what characteristics those people will have. This minority, which actually understands that the climate emergency is the overwhelming threat of our time. These people will need to have intelligence, general pragmatic intelligence, recognizing that it must be guided by expertise. Um, they will need imagination to make the prospective consequences vividly present to themselves. They need to be reflective in order to appreciate how their own lives are being robbed of meaning and purpose by participation in a biocidal system. And they'll need honesty to face that threat without resorting to the various forms of denial that are available and the courage that goes with that kind of honesty. Um, 
Now, if we ask where people with those qualities or most of those qualities are likely to be found, apart, of course, from on this Zoom call, um, the answer is going to be in many walks of life, but perhaps especially in the professions, in administration, in communication, in the management of um, the national um, industries and infrastructure and also some of the more conceptual um, private industry. So in other words, while not having the kind of power that goes with being an economic class or a governing oligarchy, um, these people have their hands on or near the levers of efficacy and legitimacy of the fossil fuel state. And the crucial thing is getting people, these people to pull these levers. Um, pursue, we need to pursue the formation of, if you like, cells of I call these people the vanguard. Uh, I, Rupert didn't like that term, but it's a one that I find useful. Um, across the broadest possible range of professional and economic occupational groupings, which can be tactically coordinated to withdraw cooperation and endorsement um, in ways that hurt, that hit, that destabilize over a significant period of time. Um, in this first program category, I, I also see a continuing electoral role for a green political movement, but it needs to be much more focused, much more disciplined than it's been. Concentrated on a very small number of seats which might become winnable as the public mood changes in response to accumulating disaster. Um, because I think if we can get elected in a few seats, some potentially powerful parliamentary performers who could sort of help to hang a parliament or even help um, in um, a government, an emergency government of national unity, then that is, you know, a, a parliamentary component of what is overall uh, still a revolutionary route forward. In the second part of the program, the building of a shadow eco state. Uh, again, there's a lot to be done in um, the sphere of working with uh, the many components of civil society which are already, as it were, trying to build local resilience, local economic and social resilience, transition towns, local economy networks, community shops and businesses, um, those kind of things, uh, working with coordinating facilitating, making more politically conscious and organised, um, all, that, all that work in civil society. But again, I think there needs to be more. There needs to be formed and actively kept in play, if you like, a, a central shadow green government, continually tracking, harrying and challenging the elected government while the fossil fuel state lasts and foregrounding the green alternative. Um, in a way that hasn't been done before, because I think, again, an important change of emphasis would be that we don't offer, you know, an alternative drawn from, or even worse, presented as a 92-page manifesto um, or anything like it, but we aim for a Leninist, and I chose that term deliberately, a Leninist cogency and simplicity. So if you think back to the Bolshevik revolution, peace and bread, land to the peasants, the factory to the workers, those were the slogans which brought the Bolsheviks to power. Now the green equivalents are there, carbon rationing, land conscription for local food security, a living wage citizen's income. These need to be ceaselessly emphasized with how they will play out transformatively through economy and society left for the future. Because no one knows how that will shake out. No one can predict it and certainly no one can offer to manage it. Crucially to there's this strand of educating public opinion. And here I don't think we should underestimate the effect which the disasters which are now inevitable, whatever we do, might have if properly interpreted. And I think here, the coronavirus 
pandemic might might potentially play a role. If it does have a lasting impact on how we tackle the climate emergency, it might be through a new attitude towards centrally directed lifestyle change in response to an emergency situation. But as it were, the emergency situation has to be perceived first, and that is the crucial difference between coronavirus and the climate emergency, which is that, you know, the large majority of people perceive the danger of themselves or their loved ones getting it and potentially dying in the really quite short term, the climate emergency just does not hit people at large like that. But it will increasingly do so as disaster plays in. If we wait until the threat is, you know, headline news in the Daily Mail, it will be too late. Um, but if recognition comes, it just may come in time to promote majority acquiescence in a revolution which is already, as it were, substantively in train. Now, crucial, obviously, to all this, as you will have gathered, is a central coordinating focus and source of strategic direction. And that's the, that's in my vision, the explicitly revolutionary Green political party uh, for which the situation now clamours. Um, but as I, um, as I hinted at the outset, this, this is a big cultural change um, for the Green Movement. Um, the emergence of such a party with leadership, strength, organisation, focus and discipline of the kind needed would require a cultural transformation in the Green Movement at least as dramatic as that which we're expecting from the population at large, um, is the Green Movement up to that, um, up to that self-transformation, much hangs on the answer. Actually, everything hangs on the answer. Um, I wasn't going to say anything about revolutionary violence um, because I thought I'd probably scared enough horses already, uh, but Rupert mentioned it at the end of his piece, so just let me say something. Um, I'm personally a great fan of nonviolence. I, like I imagine most people, I'd much rather be on the receiving end of it and of the alternative. Um, and I fully get how the committed practice of nonviolence, as developed by XR, is, you know, it's not just a good way of getting a moral half Nelson on your opponent. Uh, it's a powerful force for bringing into the movement people who might not otherwise join up. All that's very understandable. Very understandable too, it seems to me, is careful sabotage of key fossil fuel state infrastructure, motorway bridges, runways, backed by the necessary minimum of force if challenged. Um, see Leah Keith and others book Deep Green Resistance. That's very understandable too, as a reaction to our present plight. Now, while if only for conceptual reasons, you probably can't have a movement with an explicitly violent and a non-violent arm. I mean, that just seems, um, the, the concept of non-violence seems to rule that out. There are historical precedents for revolutionary movements, which have, as, as it were, run in parallel and tacitly coordinated a both a persuasive and an enforcing mode of action by different groups of people. And I think we could study and learn from those histories. Um, I don't want to say any more than that because it's obviously a very delicate issue, but um, I also think it's one we can't responsibly ignore. So thank you, that's what I have to say. Thank you, John. So there's quite a lot of various things going on in the chat. Um, I think, uh, well, first of all, I'd like to put to you Caroline's uh, comment, which says, this sounds like a sort of middle class Leninism. This party's position, position on the immorality of class and sexism, its awareness of racial and then economic inequality. I think she means your revolutionary vanguard party. Yeah, yeah, middle class. Uh, yeah, anyway, it's, it's positioned on those would be crucial because otherwise there's a real danger of perpetuating all these structural inequalities in its eco-programme. Would you like to say something about that, about class? 
I, I'm, I'm quite happy to accept middle class Leninism. I, if I'm anything, I'm a middle class Leninist um, and, and proud of it. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with being middle class if being middle class means that you have um, the qualities that I listed, intelligence, um, imagination, reflectiveness, uh, honesty and courage. Um, now, I'm not saying, as it were, that they are um, necessarily middle class qualities, but they're qualities that go with uh, a certain kind of education, a certain kind of occupational status, perhaps. Um, I don't think we can afford, uh, as it were, to be too precious about who saves us. Caroline, would you like to can I, can I just unmute you if you want to respond to that? Because I know you've got you've done quite a lot of work on this issue. Oh, I'm trying to unmute you. Can I unmute you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just I just think it, John, it it sounds um I agree with you all about the urgency and so on. But um when you do, when you talk about the individual qualities that this these people who are fit to be a ruling class must have. If no, hang on, I mean, just, just not, I didn't say fit to be a ruling class. These are the qualities that people have who are able to perceive the danger. Okay. Right. Um, okay, but they are the vanguards and next thing, and no. they are the ones who are going to draw up the programme which, right. for which they must seek consent. And it's just that the difference with Leninism was obviously that Leninism had a theory about the bottom becoming the top, and we know all the things that happened and didn't happen. But here there is no such theory. You know, the idea of a revolution is what's underneath becomes on top. And here it's what's in the middle, because it sees more clearly, um, organizes and uh, sets out a program that isn't um you know it isn't exactly analogous and that the places in which it's different from um you know leninism historical leninism which of course we could criticize till the cows came home but ignore that the places in which it's different from historical leninism are incredibly relevant to the the um depth of inequality both nationally and and in the whole world and, we, how can, how, how can, the, we've got to have a theory about that. And I, I haven't heard you talk about, you've talked about things, you know, policies like carbon tax and so on. Mm. But we have mm. to have a social theory about the entire oppressive structure which um, globalised capitalism has produced and on which it depends. Well, I don't know. I mean, I, this is clearly going to be, if it happens, an unprecedented kind of revolution. Um, we're not talking about something that's class-based and class-driven. I don't think we're necessarily talking about something that's, that has to have mass uh, support and energy here. This is an area where I, I think I differ from Rupert. I, um, I wanted to emphasize the point that um, the people who by and large have the characteristics which enable them to perceive this danger and make it real to themselves are also people who are um, either at or near uh, the levers of power in the kind of society that we have. Um, and I think my fundamental point is they don't need to wait for consent, for mass consent, to get their hands on those levers and bloody well pull them. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So I'd just like to move on to another question that came up much earlier about the Green Party and uh, whether the Green Party's fundamental trust and emphasis in democracy prevent it from, from providing the path to a sustainable outcome. That's the, would you like to say a little bit about that? And I know Rupert wants to come in with a couple of things, but I just want to take some comments from other people first. Yeah. Um... Democracy is, I think, um, a bit of a shibboleth in this context. Um, we're talking about saving the world, and that's clearly for everybody. Um, I don't think that 
um, the kind of democracy that depends on, you know, periodically counting heads and then going on to the next head count um, is any longer a, it can't be the final arbiter. Um, I think there are, um, it would probably be, take too long a digression to, to go into the political theory of it, but I don't think um, the, uh, you know, the Benthamite, um, Lockean, everyone to count as one and none for more than one um, kind of image of uh, political legitimacy is any longer relevant. Um, it was relevant in a world when the point of politics was, as it were, advancing um, the well-being, the good life of the individual citizen. Um, it's not relevant in a world when the big political issue is um, the relation of the human species to its natural environment and context and its potential survival. I think there is a danger of, um, as it were, declining to save ourselves because saving ourselves might involve undemocratic means. If that's the choice, I'm not a Democrat. Okay, so there's another comment about revolutions, John, uh, that I'll let you uh, address before, um, and also the shadow state. Uh, so one, uh, David Bent says, I'll, I won't read it all because it's quite long uh, and people can read it in the chat uh, about, um, well, many history, talking about in the Indian independence put, um, some theories put Gandhi's success on, on, on the nonviolent direct action down to the possibility of violence from elsewhere. So that's really about the violence and the nonviolent stuff. But also the danger of a revolutionary approach of being quickly overtaken by zealots who believe the ends justify the means. They're quoting the, somebody on the French Revolution, the revolution devours its children. And um, uh, so I wonder whether you'd say something about that, about how you want revolution, but how do we stop revolution turning into terror? So that's one thing. And then the other one is about the shadow state. Uh, are you saying the shadow state will also be putting out media? Do you have any examples of this kind of thing happening in other countries? Sorry, I didn't catch the last, uh, you, you sort of breaking up a bit. Say the last bit again. Uh, about, the sh uh, about the shadow state, um, do you have any examples of this kind of thing happening in other countries in a similar way to which you have described? No, I don't. Um, we, are, we are in wholly new territory. This is wholly unprecedented. We are having to invent a kind of revolution that there has never been in order to have a chance of saving humanity from a kind of plight that it has never found itself in and never been conscious of being in. Um, so I don't, I mean, no, there are no precedents. Uh, as to zealots, if only, um, I think that uh, there is obviously a danger, you know, that um, the lurking Stalin or the lurking Robespierre will, will, will um, come to the fore in any situation of revolutionary turbulence. Um, but um, that's a danger, uh, not a certainty. Uh, if we don't reach zero carbon in 20 years, um, we're fucked. Um, and with those alternatives, you know, I'm happy to take my chance on the odd zealot. Okay, so uh, Rupert, would you like to come in now? I know you've been... Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, I want to say two things. Um, I've said various things in, in, in the chat. I won't uh, go back over those and do look over the chat people. Um, I want to say two things. Firstly, in relation to what just, John's just said, as well as to the body of his remarks, I think it's really good that we're having this debate. Uh, and uh, I hope that um, the, uh, the recording will be widely viewed afterwards. I hope we'll, we'll share it and, and get that to happen. Because it really feels to me as though this debate hasn't happened um, enough 
uh, so far. It feels to me like John and I are both trying to tell the truth, but both being truthful and straight in a way that is that is rare. Um, uh, I think it's I think it's very rare. Uh, I think it's it's relatively rare even within the the Green Party. Um, I think these are the kinds of discussions that need to be had, and I very much uh, respect uh, John's. Um, bold uh, position um, in, this, uh, in this debate. The second point that I want to make is that one reason why uh, I nevertheless disagree with John on, on at least some important points, obviously there's quite a lot on which, on which we agree, um, is that I think that he may not have quite um, understood the, the, the importance of this moment, of the corona moment, because to me the real importance of this and I discussed this in my 24 theses on Corona that I put in the chat earlier. The real, there are so many importances to it, but the most important importance of it is that we are having a worldwide experience of shared vulnerability. We're having a worldwide kind of brush with mortality. Um, nothing like this has happened before in the lifetimes of most of the people alive in the world. Now, I'm older than most people alive in the world, and John is much older than most of the people alive in the world. Uh, so, so we've had a bit of this before with the, with the, the Cold War, um, right? But most people alive in the world were born after the Cold War ended, right? Uh, and they've never really had to face the, the prospect of, uh, of uh, dying along with uh, lots of other people that they know. And suddenly we're all getting that. And this experience of vulnerability is potentially... Uh, transformative and I think can see some of that transformativeness in things like the the, the mutual aid that's going on in the NHS clap and, and so on. Now if we could manage to get people to understand that that same vulnerability applies to climate and ecological disasters that it's the same just-in-time food system most crucially that is uh, that is highly vulnerable to this kind of thing and this is what I was trying to do uh, um, in the um, uh, in the in the question time program that I was on for XR uh, last autumn, that would be absolutely uh, absolutely transformative. Um, I don't think it's likely to happen, but I think it's possible, and I think that's what we should be doing right now. And I think that's what I really mean by saying this is our last chance. Just in relation to George's comment on the chat, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm biasing my points here towards the developed world. Of course, there's quite a lot of people in the global south who have had experiences of shared uh, profound vulnerability and mortality uh, uh, before. But um, uh, in, George has just put down knife crime. No, I'm sorry. That, I mean, that really isn't a very good analogy. Of course, knife crime is horrible and, and serious and so on. But knife crime doesn't have everybody across the country and across the world simultaneously feeling, oh my God, you know, I could die, or even if not me, then my parents could die, or my grandparents. Uh, um, uh, Paul Kings North, is it? Uh, or no, Dougal Tyne calls it um, a planetary brush with parental mortality. Um, so yeah, um, uh, of course there are people in the world who are well used to that. But we, uh, the ones who are causing most of the trouble and have to change the most, right, uh, are not well used to it. Um, and that's a, that's a tremendously important wake-up call for those of us who bear the most historical responsibility and have the most changing to do. So that's, that's what I'd like to put back to John. Uh, can I just come in and say, uh, perhaps John could also, there was a thing earlier on which I which I uh, omitted to raise, I'm sorry, about the gilets jaunes in France. And, and does John think that the lesson of the gilets jaunes is that a viable, sustainable alternatives have to be available before people will abandon the old ways of fossil fuel dependence? Um, I do you want to say something about that, um, sort of, um, how we deal with, with that sort of uh, protest? On that, on that, on that point, um, uh, yes, I think. I mean, I, I think that what the Gilets Jaunes have shown is precisely that. Um, we need to be um, building up and demonstrating that there are alternative uh, ways of doing it, and that's the point of, as it were, <clears throat> constructing a shadow eco-state in parallel to destabilising the fossil fuel state. 
Um, and clearly, you know, these two things have got to be presented together. But I'm coming back to what Rupert was saying about um, coronavirus and um, shared vulnerability. I mean, I, that's a powerful point, and I wouldn't want to dismiss it. Uh, and I think there is hope there. Um, certainly there's hope in, you know, the ways in which people have been building and developing community responses to this, um, uh, the ways in which people have been um, becoming more aware that, as it were, we live in a, a network of community, not as isolated individuals striving against one another. I think all those things are important and I hope that there will be, as it were, a continuing corona bonus, if one could so call it as something as crude as that, um, going forward. Um, but I think that it will, we will see any benefits that we do see from that slowly. We will see them in response to um, further disasters, possibly further pandemics, which will need, as it were, clearly linking, as the coronavirus thing ought to be vigorously and clearly linked to the ways in which we are failing to interact properly with the natural world, um, yeah. because that's where it's come from. Yeah. Um, and, you know, just to endorse Rupert's point, I, the, the powerful green voice saying that has been notable by its absence over the last few weeks. Yeah. Um, I think it will, it will come slowly. It will come in response to um, uh, a raft of disasters, which, which are now in, inevitably coming. We need to get working as it were, in advance of that, um, so that this that, that bonus of, of community and understanding and shared vulnerability, if it comes, um, can be fed into the acceptance of changes which are, as it were, already being driven forward by um, what I call unapologetically a revolutionary vanguard. Okay, so has anybody got any uh, like comments that they'd like to make that aren't specifically directed as questions to John or Rupert? Perhaps if you'd like to just put it in the, uh, oh, there's a very long thing there. Well, people can raise their hands as well at this point, I think, Anne. Uh, yeah, it's difficult for me to see them all. Uh, Mark Jackson, would you like to just say something about what you, have I haven't got time to read it all, perhaps you'd like to just say something about it? I yeah, just a, just a little bit um, about the Leninist thing. Uh, communism was defeated in 1981 with the fall of Gorbachev and Shevardnadze and Perestroika and Glasnost. And uh, th that basically was the end of that in 79. Don't read your whole comment, yeah. Socialism was defeated in Britain with Thatcher, with, with Thatcher. Um, there was a brief period of social democracy for just a couple of years with Blair and Brown. I mean, I believe the British people aren't capitalist, aren't socialist, they're social democratic. And uh, again, in 2019, the, the uh, Labour Party was defeated again with the, with their program so i see that there's the i don't see that there is a revolutionary vanguard available unless that's momentum and i don't think the momentum have got it together to be that revolutionary vanguard i for one as a green want to see a revolution but a green revolution and for that to be a non-violent direct action revolution alongside e extinction rebellion Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh... So that, that sounds to me like a sort of an, an attempt to kind of uh, put together what uh, John and I uh, are saying. Uh, he wants a revolution, but he wants to be uh, non-violent. Um, what would you say to that, uh, John? 
Um, well, I, um, I, I, Mark is right. Um, there isn't, uh, as it were, a revolutionary vanguard ready to hand. Um, we are in the process of making it. Discussions like this are part of the process of its formation and coming to consciousness, or they should be. Um, and uh, the point that I'm not quite sure what the point about the you know communism being overthrown in 1981 was. Uh, the Bolshevik <coughs> revolution ultimately failed. Um, that's because Lenin had invested in um, the Marxist view of history, um, which he thought was science, but actually wasn't. Um, we're invested in uh, science, the science of um, global warming and um, you know the um, the uh, uh, IPCC uh, science, which which we know to be right. Okay, so um, I don't think we're running the same risks as the Bolsheviks. Anybody else like to come in with a comment? Um, uh, sorry, I'm not really quite keeping up with the chat. Uh, Caroline's got one again. Uh, or Yasmin. Uh, oh, I'll let Caroline and then and then Yasmin's written. Uh, written. Oh, go on, Caroline. Um, well, it says I'm muted, but I'm not. No. I'm muted. Okay. Um, it's a very quick one. It's just what I haven't understood yet from you, John, is whether the important ecological policies that the, the vanguard is going to um, propose or impose are within a capitalist framework. I mean, what is the economic system? Is it, is it going to be a much simpler economy using bioregionalism or, or what? Uh, you know, I, I can't, re you know, all the policies that the Green Party, for instance, advocates assume a continuation of some form of capitalism, e even if not neoliberal globalization. I think I need that to be clearer. Uh, well, if that's a question to me, um, I, I don't see, um, perhaps I'm, uh, this is a part of the point that Mark was making, I don't see um, this as necessarily, um, as it were, a, 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 a socialist versus capitalist um, issue. I think those terms are, are outdated. Um, clearly, global capitalism is, is screwed and has to be got rid of. Um, but uh, lots of forms of, um, you know, locally resilient enterprise, which might well uh, have been described in earlier times as capitalists are going to need to continue in order to um, in order to feed people uh, and clothe people and give people employment. Um, but the context for that is does will have to be set centrally. Um, people will have to reduce their individual have to have their individual personal mobility drastically reduced the product miles of the stuff they consume will have to be drastically reduced um i mean i <laughs> it goes back to the the old um thing that the, the 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 green party used to say back in the day before it was the green party when i used to stand for parliament for the ecology party not left or right but forward yes <laughs> uh Yasmin, do you want to say a little bit about what you so you basically say that that the the problem that not everybody can sort of afford has the headspace, if you like, worrying about the climate because because they've got more pressing issues, which I think is a real issue. But I wonder if you want to say a little bit about that. I think I've unmuted you. No, I have unmuted you. There you go. Got muted again. <laughs> uh, Not working. Try now, Yasmin. No, we can't hear you. Don't know why. I think you must have not. Yeah, I think there's a problem there. with your mic. The mic isn't working. Yeah. So I think that. Um, 
yes, it's hard to see the. So for people that have, you know, have got money worries, it seems uh, it's hard not to be absorbed by the day to day. Uh, this probably prevents some people from having the time or means to think about the climate, the prioritisation of meeting, of firstly meeting basic needs. And I think that's very right. And one response to that could be to say, well, uh, in a way, what John Foster was saying, about basically the middle class vanguard, or basically because it's the middle classes that have got the headspace to think about this because they've got more. Um, because they've got le that level of economic security. And that is to say that the views of other people don't matter, but the issue is to how, um, how the climate situation can be addressed and the problems of people that are struggling financially. That's my, um, my little comment. Now, who would, now I've got, oh, right. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got a thing that's saying you can't hear me clearly. Yeah, we more or less got it. Yeah, okay. Um, so, uh, Chris, would you like to say, say this, but you've put the question is, so if I have you, would you like to make a contribution? Um, no, not really. I think I was just sort of going along with what people were saying. I just think the vulnerability is a really important issue that taps into everything for different people in different ways. And all that, all the issues have vulnerability at the root of them. Hmm. And yep. we all share that. Yeah. Food supplies, health, economic loss, whatever, illness, you know, access to things, all in different ways. But it's a common, common theme for everyone. That's my point. And how do we talk to that? Um, has anybody else got any comments that they would like to make? Oh, there's another message there. At the same time, there's more comments about my... my uh... <laughs> not so bad now. Is it not so bad now? Oh, sorry, it's... Uh... Okay. So uh, Rupert says he's written a pamphlet on the vulnerability story written before the coronavirus crisis. And uh, Jonathan, actually, would you like to come in, Jonathan? You've made a few comments which I haven't referred mm. to, so perhaps I'll give you a chance to have a little say. Can um, one of the co-hosts find... Uh, Jonathan. Hello. Um, I did ask one question, which was about how the coronavirus has reduced demand, particularly for transport. And, you know, what, what, who, who might be the vanguarders who, who take that forward and, and turn us from one emergency response, hopefully straight into the next one? Yeah. Uh, and I've got, uh, it says Yannick has his hand up. Can, um, oh, there we go. I'll unmute you, Yannick. Would you like to make a comment? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, uh, Rupert and John for, for sharing your insights and opinions. I was just very keen on finding out or trying to understand a little more about this role or opportunities that a potential kind of shadow government may have in the green politics uh, context in, in Britain. What, what, what would it be like? What, what could it be when it comes to the legitimation of, of policies, for example? Mm. What would you like to respond on that? To both the question is to both. Yeah, can I can I start on that? Because John's already said stuff about that, and then maybe John can come in. Um, Thank you. Look again. I want to say that I think that uh, that, that John, the questions John is raising are really pertinent, as I hope are the questions that I'm uh, raising. And I think John creates some really kind of good, bold um, objectives and ideas for the kind of way that Greens should be thinking if they're actually uh, uh, serious about making the kind of changes that we need uh, to make in the timescale available. You know, let's, let's, st let's think about this historically for a minute. Um, uh, I've got a badge, uh, I wish I'd brought it with me to this call, that says, uh, it's a really old badge now, it says, Green Party, I love you, but we only have 40 years to save the earth, right? Um, 
Uh, and of course, that's the kind of badge that you can't uh, create uh, uh, any longer. We don't have 40 years. We've got a lot, lot less than that. And what John is trying to do is uh, get us to think about <laughs> what that means. Um, and you know, I, I, in some ways, I wish I had uh, more faith that his um, that his um, recommendations were um, were ones that could work. Uh, I suspect, obviously, that my recommendations are more likely to work. I still think they're very unlikely to work, but I think they might. <laughs> uh, and that's what I mean by saying I think we have a, a last chance. And by the way, if we su don't succeed in taking that last chance, remember that I'm saying that there's always still things that we can do. Um, the importance of, uh, of uh, transition type stuff, the transition uh, towns movement, uh, obviously of deep adaptation and so on just increases um, in that uh, circumstance. But yeah, I wish that, uh, I wish that, um, that more Greens were thinking about the kind of things that John asks as well as the kind of things that I'm asking. And that's why I hope that more people will watch this debate after tonight, and I suspect they will. Um, let me also just, while, while I've got the mic for one second, say something a bit more about vulnerability because people have been very interested in that. And I do think this is just so absolutely key. Um, if there is any hope in, in this moment, you know, that's where it is. And this relates to the question that Jonathan asked, because what you need to do is you need to affect this sort of movement from people's experience of vulnerability to a vision that answers to that experience, which is big enough to answer to it, and that will result in policies, et cetera, that will add up to answering to it. So yeah, that's what we need to do so you know right now we need to be demanding and, and we should be doing some of this we should be starting to do some of this by non-violent direct action and not just by request we should be demanding that for example more road space is given over to pedestrians and cyclists it's happening in other countries in the world right now uh, it should be happening here in britain it's a scandal that it isn't thank you rupert um, i wonder whether uh and you say you, you put a comment in and I thought you might have uh, something interesting to say about all the, uh, the discussion about class. Would you like to say anything about that? You talked about vulnerability in the welfare state in your comments. Yeah, um, there was this discussion with um, Mon George Monbiot, Caroline Lewis and Fazia Shanin on the web the other day. And I think it was Monbiot or Caroline who used the um, metaphor of the collective immune system of the welfare state, and that's been eroded for decades. And it's so obvious we need it now. People, you know, just looking at the way food banks are having are struggling. Um, so yeah, that's very directly a class thing now. For those people, they need money now. Um, and you, you know the way that the um, landlords have been bailed out, bank, banks have been protected, mortgage holidays for landlords and so on, but not for renters, not for and you know other people thrown on the mercy of the um, universal um, credit system. Um, there's a tremendous class dimension and other forms of inequality, race and and so on. And um, unless we're very sensitive about that, then we will be dismissed as middle-class people who've got time to indulge these less, less apparently urgent things. Yeah, although just one quick point on that. Um, that the point obviously is partly about the urgency. Um, and uh, when you've, uh, it's, it's Clear to people how all this stuff uh, in terms of economic stuff and also health stuff is urgent right now um, uh, and it, sh it should be easier than it's been before now to make the connection to the uh, to the urgency of uh, of of guarding ourselves against similar future threats right so in other words uh, one of the key things we have to do is we have to we need to we need to say to people look do you see how it would have been so much better if we'd have um, prepared ourselves for the possibility of a pandemic like this? If we'd have been precautionary, right? If we'd have uh, if we'd have um, acted on the recommendations of the various government reports, with some of which which I've been publicising in the last several years. Uh, there's a very fascinating story that uh, apparently um, I think it's Singapore 
um, responded very well to coronavirus um, because they, they acted on the British government's recommendations for pandemic preparedness. And the difference is that Singapore acted on them, whereas we just had the recommendations and didn't do anything with them. So we need to, make, we need to say to people, look, um, as well as being able to respond well to the pandemic, we need to be ready to, to, to act to prevent and if necessary, suppress future pandemics, right? Right. Okay, it's just basically the same for climate and ecology. And of course, we also need to connect them even more directly by making the point, which as John says, hasn't been brought out as much as it should have been, that the reason we got this pandemic is to do with ecological destruction and bad treatment of animals, and maybe also to do with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with climate breakdown. So the just-in-time system, for example, right, which is, which is now, you know, which is showing us our vulnerability, um, yeah, that's, that's at, every bit as exposed um, due to the, the climate emergency as it is uh, due to this one. You know, climate disasters, bad harvests, etc. they're coming. You know, they're, they're, they're coming, they're already here, but they're coming more uh, every year. You know, that's, that's the task. And if we can do that, you know, then things get a lot better. Could I just say something in response um, first to, um, to Andrew and then to Yannick, because I didn't get a chance to um, at this point. Uh, so in response to Andrew, yes, uh, I mean, everything lies in the apparently more urgent, doesn't it? Yeah, there are lots and lots of people who at the moment have shit lives, and that's a great shame. But if the people who don't have shit lives don't get their asses in gear to do something about it, then pretty soon everybody will have a shit life, and then shortly after that, not much life at all. So um, that's the got to be the focus. And if that means that, as it were, um, the people who, who, who now see the danger and act have a certain... Uh, economic and occupational and class status, so be it. We cannot afford to be precious about that. Um, and Yannick asked, you know, what would this shadow green government look like? Well, two points, you know, a media operation hitting every issue, you know, in a way that makes Alistair Campbell look like a wuss. Um, and also, the assembly of cohorts of people um, able and willing and ready to move in and take over the reins of government when the existing system collapses. It's as crude as that. Thank you. Just did, I was about, I was said that the typing from in response to uh somebody uh Maui laugh uh oh yes about uh people not having time and any tips and i think the important thing is to do what you can whatever in whatever situation you're in and often you find that that over time what you think you can do sort of expands um so we've all got a lot of time at the moment um <laughs> The vast amount of time on our hands. Let's start tomorrow. Yeah. Well, some people have. Not everybody has. I think it's certainly some people like me. I think I, I felt at the beginning of this lockdown, I felt like this sense of relief that I was going to get a lot more time. And I'm suddenly realising that actually I haven't. I've still got lots to do. So, um, yes. And also, some people are still working really hard, of course. Mm. We mustn't forget that. But some people are still having to go. Some people are still having to leave their homes and go to work and uh, we shouldn't forget that it's not the experience isn't the same for everybody so i think it's now two minutes to nine so i think um, we ought to draw things to a close um we're going to make the uh the um uh, the recording available via the website um, as it's been pointed out, you can copy the chat if you want. If you do that now before I end the meeting, uh, by uh, select all and then uh, pasting it somewhere. Um, if you if you want to to have a record of that. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And uh, if you're not already signed up to the greenhouse newsletter, 
you can do that on our website, greenhousethinktank.org. Um, and we will be uh, doing another online event, probably May, early June, which is more focused. I know that the, the response to the uh, coronavirus pandemic has rather sort of taken over this, this discussion. Um, but that discussion will be specifically about the implications for facing up to climate reality. So um, I hope you might be interested in taking part in that one as well.